Welcome to Digitally Creative. I'm your host, Vincent Ferrari, and this week, it's a Q&A episode. Um, didn't have a guest, but Jeff Stein, a.k.a. a weird guy, um, he actually had the idea that I should just do a Q&A episode instead of just doing a random topic episode where I talk. And you know what, Jeff? Good idea, bro. Um, I like do. I actually like doing Q&A episodes. I always worry that I'm not going to get enough Q's and A's to do a complete episode, but I think I'm just going to have to stop worrying about that and just do these types of episodes more often when I need what <laughs> what I hate calling, but kind of are filler episodes. So we are going to do a question and answer episode. And since he came up with the idea, let's actually start with Jeff Stein, aka a weird guy who asks, what you been working on lately? You know, had you asked that question last year, I would have probably had about 50 different answers for you. The funny thing is I haven't been working on a whole lot except trying to not lose my apartment and be able to pay the rent. So I've been doing a lot of consulting, trying to do more of it, um, digital work, um, stuff like that, like stuff that I can do where I am here. I've also been working on and you might have seen it on my Instagram feed, I actually have some stuff that I'm making using, using resincrete for home decor type stuff, candle holders, you know, tea light candle holders and stuff like that. And I'm going to start making more of that stuff and putting it up on my shop and seeing if that goes well. Plus, I have a bunch of digital designs that are, I'm in the process of packaging them up a little bit so that they look a little better for download purposes. Those are going to be available on my website, so you can actually go to my site and get, um, you know, sticker packs, like cute unicorn kitten mermaid type sticker sticker packs. I have shirt designs that I've been doing, um, stuff like that. I have all that kind of stuff that's going to all be on my website as digital assets, and hopefully somebody will find, um, hopefully so, it'll, somebody will find it in themselves to need that stuff, and like, or even just see it and say, hey, you know, maybe I don't need this now, but I might need it in the future. I'm just going to buy it and uh, use it later. So there, there is some stuff in the works. Um, obviously, my shop is gone, but my tools are not. And this past weekend, was it this past weekend? Yeah, it was this past weekend. No, was it this? I, whatever, it's not important. Last week at some point. I had an idea about a way I can make my Glowforge accessible in Kathy's basement, which is a major step forward for me to get that running again. Um, it's going to take a little work, uh, but I think I can do it. And if I do it and I get everything in that basement that's currently down there on wheels in some form or another, I can get back to work. And that's going to be a big freaking deal. So it's just a matter of like, I can't, I'm one person, right? So I can't empty the basement, do all the work, put everything back in the basement. I, I just I can't. It's not physically possible for me to do that much by myself. So I kind of have to, while I'm moving stuff, make enough space to make things to put things on wheels, put them on wheels, then move the stuff around strategically. And it's it's difficult. It's but I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I needed a plan. And I was down there uh, two weeks ago, and I finally developed what I think is a good strategy to make this all happen. So I have faith that it's going to work out. It's just going to take a lot of work. And I'm, I'm not allergic to work. Um, but it also has to be work that I'm capable of doing alone or maybe with my friend Joe's help if he's you know available just to help me shuffle stuff around a little bit. So I, it's not the end of the world. I'm nowhere near as busy as I would like to be, but while I'm here and I'm not in my shop, I'm working on new products, a lot of graphic design stuff. I've been taking Abby Connick's course on the pencil tool in Adobe Illustrator, which sounds very, very specific, right? Taking a course on one tool in a very large application, but that one tool can do a lot of things that I didn't know how to do before the course. So I'm, I'm also trying to do, I guess what you could call continuing education, trying to give myself more of a skill set, trying to 
you know, this way if I have to take on a design job for somebody, I have the skill set to do it. I mean, I, my skill set in Adobe Illustrator is pretty good now, but it's getting better um, the more I do. And I'm getting to the point where I'm more comfortable taking on design work for third parties. And, you know, some of the consulting stuff I was doing, you know, over the last couple of months is starting to really ramp up to turn into actual products. So things are as dire as they are. They're also, I feel like if I just had a more of a cushion, I would be okay. Like, I really do feel like I'm going to be okay. I just have to make it work for a little while longer and everything's going to work out. So I'm hoping, but what I've been working on lately, Jeff, um, building another business that can supplement the shop stuff that I used to do while I can't do it. That's pretty much what I've been working on. doesn't sound like a great business, but honestly, I'm kind of happy that I think I've kind of gotten there. Um, I had a very good phone call this morning with somebody that is going to, that's going to result in some, some revenue, which is good. I mean, it's, it's all, it's all good. It's, I'm scared. It feels hopeless. It feels like I'm, at a, I'm, I'm worried about hitting the brick wall and I'm six inches from it, but I'm not going to freaking stop. I am not going to give up and I'm not going to freaking submit. Not going to happen. So yeah, that's what I've been working on. Um, next up, <laughs> next up is best man, Al Schultz from New York Woodworks. He may have noticed I started calling him best man. I don't know if I actually said on the show, but a couple of weeks ago, I actually asked Al to be my best man at my wedding next year because um, I can't think of another human being on this planet. And I, 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 you know, I have a lot of friends. I have a lot of people who are good to me and treat me well and people who I consider more family than friends because I don't really have a lot of friends, so to speak. My friends are my family. I don't have a lot of family. I have no, I have no family, essentially. So, you know, Al is as close to family as I have on this earth. And... If I had to pick someone to stand with me when I get married, I cannot think of a person more deserving of standing up there with me than the one person who has literally always come through for me when I needed him. He has saved my ass in the last four years so many times. I mean, so four years? Three, yeah, three-ish, four-ish. Yeah, first time I met him was right after the pandemic started. So, yeah three-ish years, Al's the man, and that's why he is best man Al Schultz, not just big big Al Schultz from New York Woodworks, is now best man Al Schultz from New York Woodworks, um, and I couldn't be happier about that, and he asked a very funny question, but I actually do have an answer for it, and his question is, so why don't wrestlers look like John Cena and The Rock anymore? Al, you're not going to believe this, but I actually do have an answer for that question. Okay, it's twofold. It's twofold. The first, the first part of it is that major wrestling organizations, after the big Vince McMahon lawsuit, um, when he got sued for having a whole, essentially a whole steroid ring inside the WWF back in the old days, um, after that, WW, well, WWF slash WWE, which I'll be calling WWE going forward, um, instituted some pretty stringent guidelines about certain types of steroids. And that's important. That's very important. So I don't know how much people listening to this have actually watched professional wrestling, but if you look at the, the guys... The jacked up guys. And, I, you know, there aren't that many jacked up guys anymore. You know, modern wrestling, the wrestlers don't look like they used to look. They just don't. Um, you know, you think about guys like, um, like the Ultimate Warrior and Rick Rude after his hiatus when he came back all jacked up. And um, who else? Lex Luger. Lex Luger is a very good example. And Scott Steiner. Like all these guys that were just jacked like superhuman size right they were all on steroids i mean it's pretty safe to say that we all know they were all on steroids it's not 
it's not a big secret, and I don't really care if somebody uses steroids. I don't think it's a big deal. If you want to do that to your body and kill yourself, go for it. <laughs> not my place, not killing me, not hurting me by doing it, hurting you. Um, but all these guys were taking these crazy steroids. Eventually, though, eventually, and this is kind of what you hear in the scuttlebutt around, is that the, the type of steroids that they take go from these crazy, make you gigantic, looks like you have balloons under your skin type muscles, to more of a, just a large body type muscle, which is why you don't see freakish muscle bodybuilder looking guys in professional wrestling anymore. That's a big reason for it, because the steroids that they're taking, which are basically probably more like human growth hormone type stuff, and I don't know that that's legal in WWE, but I also don't know that it's illegal in WWE. And it's pretty obvious that some people aren't just hitting the gym really, really hard. Um, you know, some people had a big head start with Vince and then stopped taking the steroids, and now they don't look the same. And I can name at least two or three wrestlers, and I won't because I don't want to throw anyone under the bus for their bad behavior. But there's one guy in WWE in particular who clearly was on a, a lot of steroids, and I'm not talking like, oh, he was just working out, you know, a lot, and now he's working out less. I'm talking he was clearly on steroids and is not anymore, and his body looks it. Um, he's not out of shape, but he ain't the guy he was. And I know he still hits the gym because people talk about his crazy workout schedule. But anyway, that's number one. Number two, the style of wrestling is not what it used to be. Those big guys always had one problem. And in fact, as those guys, as these guys got bigger, what you started to see is they weren't as mobile. And a big guy with giant biceps and giant forearms is just not going to be as mobile as someone who is not. Like, it's just not, it's not a possibility. You're not going to have a guy... You're not going to have a guy that's got giant arms and legs who can move around the ring quick enough. And the, the simple fact is that modern wrestling, love it or hate it, modern wrestling is much quicker than it used to be. The, 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 the athletes are much faster. They move around the ring quicker. They move from place to place quicker. They, um, they, don't, they don't have... So there's these... In the old days, when a guy got tired, they used to have something called a rest hold, a rest hold was something like a bear hug or a chin lock, like that kind of stuff. The stuff, you know, but you would always hear the commentators go, oh, he's wearing them down. He's wearing them down. No, he's not wearing them down. They're taking a rest, right? Because that was, they don't do that anymore. Every wrestler is much more nimble. They are much smaller. They climb, they all climb the ropes. They can all do moves that were unheard of for normal people to do. You can't do that if you're a giant you know, jacked up on crazy steroids with huge muscles. It just doesn't, you're not going to have the mobility you need to compete in modern wrestling anymore. Um, it's just the way it is. So it's twofold. It's the, the types of steroids that are used and checked for change. So, and people just aren't going that jacked up bodybuilder route. But the other thing is that it wouldn't be practical to be that big in modern wrestling. It just, wouldn't work. You wouldn't have the mobility you need to keep up with some of the top stars in the business. Even if you think about the top guys in WWE, um, Roman Reigns, Cody Rhodes, Finn Balor, Seth Rollins, like those guys, none of they're 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 well built, but they're not big, huge guys. Even Roman Reigns, who's the biggest of them, not a big dude. Um, he's just. You know, he's not super muscular. He's just, he's big. He's a big guy. He's 6'6 six, six or 6'7, six, whatever he is. He, I think he's 245. He's muscular. He's very muscular, but he's not like crazy jacked up. Um, and even in AEW, you know, the world champion, Maxwell Jacob Friedman, not a huge guy. Um, his number one, his pal and his, the number one contender, Adam Cole, not a big guy by any stretch. None of there's very few big guys even in AEW. Even the biggest guys aren't crazy jacked up. So, anyway, that's the answer, Al. It's a long answer, but that's the answer. It's twofold. It's 
interesting to dive into. If you're a wrestling fan, you've seen the evolution of these people over the years, and yeah, they aren't as big as they used to be, and that's the reason for it. Next up is Rory from RLL Woodworks and DIY, and he says, when you think back, what was your favorite episode of Because We Make, besides mine, of course? Any contests or challenges in the future on Digitally Creative? I've been trying to think of a good challenge to do here. And I had an idea a couple of months ago and just didn't really, it didn't feel exciting enough to bother presenting it. So I kind of just forgot about it. I'd like to do some kind of challenge. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, if people want me to come up with something interesting to do, I, I would totally be willing to do it. Um, I'm not against it. Even with Because We Make, we did the Because We we did the Enlighten Us Challenge, which was a huge hit. A lot of people participated. There were people that participated in that challenge that weren't even listeners of the podcast before we announced the challenge. So it actually brought new listeners in. That was really cool. But the second challenge that we did, the unwrap a what was it? Unwrap whatever it was. Unwrap a challenge. That's what we called it. Unwrap a challenge. It didn't quite, even though it was an easier challenge for people to participate in, um, it didn't quite take off the same way. And I, we, Ethan and I, we kind of felt like after that one, I was like, I, I think challenges are kind of like, you know, they're fun and people participate in them, but, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not thinking that I can do something unique to make people want to do a challenge. That, then again... I could be wrong. And if I'm wrong, feel free to tell me. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways to get in touch with me. Y'all know where to find me. Let me know if you want me to come up with a, some kind of challenge with prizes and all that good stuff. I'm sure I can find people to sponsor it. Because that was the other thing. I had a lot more access to sponsors for the Because We Make challenges. I don't really have that now. Um, maybe I can get some makers to sponsor stuff. But yeah, if that's something you guys would like to do. Um, but I, I just... If you, wanted, if you want me to do it, I'm expecting the people that say, yes, we want you to do it, to actually participate. Don't tell me you want to do it, and then I get one entry. That, makes, that would be a complete waste of time. So, yeah. Um, Rory, I'll get back to the first part of your question. Don't worry. I know I didn't answer it. I'm going to get back to it later. Trust me. But, yeah, that's um, challenges. I'm not against challenges. Let's just say that. I'm not against them. Um, I just, if the right one, if I had the, an idea for the right one come along, I'm all in. Next up is um, Ed from Ed's Clocks and More, and he says, when's the wedding? <laughs> Kathy and I have talked about next year being, we don't want to be engaged forever. Um, so we're talking about next year, um, but obviously financially that's a big ask. Now, I keep saying I don't have a whole lot of people that I would want to invite, um, but she does, <laughs> and it's there's nothing wrong with that. It's, she has a big family. She has a lot of friends, and um, it's it will it will be hard to do a wedding. It was hard enough to do my first wedding, and that was we paid Beth and I paid I think twenty seven thousand dollars was the final tab, and that was in two thousand one. That would be what a Fifty-five, sixty thousand dollar wedding now. Obviously, we're not looking to have. And Kathy and I have talked about this because it's neither of us. It's not our first rodeo for either of us, so we're not talking about anything on the scale of what we had. But um, next year, sometime, hopefully, um, or at least have a date by next year. <laughs> um, and the second question is, when are we having Andy Berkey? It's a good question. Um, Andy Berkey was going to be on Because We Make, and it just kind of never happened. There was no particular reason it never happened. It just didn't happen. Um, I would love to have Andy on. Um, I know he's been through some stuff in the last couple of years. He's had the um, his shop, you know, burnt down, and that's not cool, and nobody should have to go through that kind of thing. Um, very good question. Well, when are we having Andy Berkey? I should reach out to him since I always tell people, tell me who you want me to have on. Andy Berkey would be a very good guest. Um, his story is amazing. I'm sure he has a lot. Um, 
he has a lot to talk about now, especially with what's going on with his shop. And maybe I'll see if I can uh, reach out to Andy because I do know Andy and Andy does know me. So, um, all right, Ed, you got it. <laughs> Working on it. Next up is Earl. And Earl asks, what's your favorite non-digital creative outlet? This I had, I've been thinking about this one since he asked, by the way. And it's, it's, I don't know. Um, I have a lot of them, but I think my favorite non-digital creative outlet, I, I couldn't, actually, I don't really know. I don't know. I don't have a good answer for a favorite because there's nothing that doesn't involve a computer or a screen that I find so compelling to do that if I stopped doing it, I would be sad. Um, like I have thought many times about just taking my whole craft room and just dumping it because it's just like, it's not making me money. And sometimes it's just more frustrating than it is joyful. Like, let's just get rid of it. But I do enjoy, and I'm getting to enjoy more. So maybe this is the answer to the question. I am getting to enjoy painting and modifying things, whatever those things are. So the, um, the pokey shrooms that I was making, like, I love these. I want to do more of this kind of stuff. Like, I think these are super cute, and they're super fun to make. Um, I enjoy, I've been enjoying painting. Not painting portraits and scenes and Bob Rossing myself, but I've been really enjoying, like, painting stuff, like learning how to paint and getting better at painting and getting better at art in general. And that, unfortunately doesn't answer your question because that ain't, for me art includes digital but getting building up my eye so that I can kind of understand what to do to draw something or sketch something or stuff like that so art has become a much more important part of my non-screen time stuff even though a lot of the art that I do is done on a screen um, but I don't consider that like digital as much as it's art, you know, because I just like it. So the second part of the question is, what's your all-time favorite Pokemon? That's easy, Charmander. Um, in fact, um, <laughs> you'll, anyone who plays Pokemon Go will appreciate this. And I know a few of you do because I have you as friends on Pokemon Go. And if I don't have you a as a friend on Pokemon Go, get in touch with me on Instagram so we can exchange trainer codes because I'd love to have you as a friend. I'm one of those rabid gift givers on Pokemon Go. So you get a gift for as long as I can send a gift, you'll have a gift from me. Um, anyway, it's Charmander. And the, the, the conundrum I'm facing right now is Charmander is my buddy in Pokemon Go. Because in Pokemon Go, you have to pick a buddy. One of the first things you do, your first Pokemon becomes your buddy when you start the game. So back in July of 2016, when I started playing the game, um, obviously Charmander's always been my favorite Pokemon, so I was like, well, this is a no-brainer. Of course I'm going to pick Charmander. I mean, it's kind of like, duh. So I picked Charmander. Charmander, except for buddies that I needed to, um, except for Pokemon I needed to make my buddy to evolve, has been my buddy since the beginning. I haven't changed out buddies. And I'm the conundrum I'm facing right now is Charmander, I would like to evolve Charmander and start using him in battles. But if I evolve Charmander, he's not a Charmander anymore. He's a Charizard and then later a Charmeleon. Or, excuse me, a Charmeleon, then a Charizard. I don't want to do that. I want him to be a Charmander forever. So I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm probably going to pull the trigger and start evolving him soon, even though it pains me to lose a Charmander, my favorite Pokemon of all time. But I'll know deep down in my own mind that he is, in fact... Um, he is, in fact, my Charmander, the first one, the original, the OG, the first Pokemon I caught in the game. Um, he asked a bunch of... Earl was funny because Earl asked a bunch of Pokemon questions, and I, anyone that knows me knows I could talk about Pokemon forever. And I just... I didn't answer all of them. One of the ones he asked, though, was like... Um, actually, two of the ones he asked is, how, what's my experience with the franchise? Have I played all the games? Have I, um, you know, did I try the card game or the trading figure game and all that stuff? So I'll give you a brief history just so, you know, anyone who's interested in this, you know, 
cool. We can bond over Pokemon. Anyone that's not hanging there, it won't be that long. Um, my experience with Pokemon, I in t- 1998, I want to say it was 1998. It might have been 1999. Just putting this out there. It could have been either one. I don't know. Um, I got the flu. And I'm talking, I had the worst flu I have ever had in my entire life. And I will literally say that I thought I was dying. Um, I was in utter agony. I was achy all over. I could not keep food down. Anywhere food could come out, food came out. I won't go more into detail than that. I was beyond sick. And it just so happened that at my parents' house, Beth was staying there, um, you know, at my parents' house. And, you know, we were, we were, she was taking care of me. And I didn't say that in quotes because, I didn't say that in quotes because she was, and I'm saying that in quotes because that's not why she was there. She was there because, you know, she used to stay over all the time. And one, it was a Sunday morning. I know it was a Sunday morning because got up late and everybody was home. And my, my sister was going to the mall. And she asked, um, she asked Beth if Beth wanted to go with her. So Beth's like, of course. So Beth goes, do you want anything? I was like, yeah, I just need something to like entertain me. I said, I, cause I couldn't get out of bed. I was, just, it wasn't happening. I was a disaster. So she came back and she had gone to Babbage's at the time before it was GameStop. And she got me Pokemon Red and the, the Prima strategy guide for it. And that was my first exposure to Pokemon, and I've loved it ever since. Like, I played the absolute hell out of that game. I played that game. I played that game until I got rid of it. That, I mean, that's, I played the hell out of it. It, was, it got, had a lot of hours on it. That was my experience with Pokemon. Um, it it kind of went on hiatus. I didn't really keep up with the series because there were just so many games coming out constantly. I never played the card game. Um, and then when Pokemon Go came out, I had already been playing Ingress, which is the other Niantic game that was super duper popular. Um, I started playing Pokemon Go and it was like, this is the most fun ever. I played it for about a year and I gave up after that because it was like, I was kind of not, there was nothing to do. Like it was like, oh, I'm going to catch again. Cause in the beginning, Pokemon Go was kind of a boring game to play. I was like, ah, screw it. I'm done with this. New Year's Eve of this past New Year, so New Year's Eve 2022, the woman I was dating was playing it on the couch next to me. And I'm like, and she goes, do you play this? And I'm like, I did. She goes, you should start playing again. And I opened it up and I had no idea what the hell anything was. So much had changed. And I got really into it that day. On New Year's Day, her and I went to a park over here and we played... We were there for like two and a half hours, like just walking around collecting Pokemon, like building stuff up. It was great. It was, and I've been hooked ever since. So I've basically been hooked most of this year. (laughs) It's been an absolute hoot. Um, Card game. I played the card game on the web, on the app, on the phone. It's very good. It's clearly based on the card game. I don't understand the rules and there isn't enough hand holding in it for me. So I don't know that the card game's ever going to be my thing, but That's my Pokemon lineage. Sorry to bore you all with Pokemon stuff, but that is the Pokemon story. So lineage goes way back to the OG Pokemon Red and um, with a big gap, but I've been playing some of the older games now. I've also been playing, just real quick side note, I've been playing Pokemon Stadium on the Nintendo Switch. Pokemon Stadium is fantastic. Like, I wish they would update that game for modern systems because I would love to play that exact game on a modern system. Absolutely super fun game. I, I wish I had it for the Nintendo 64 when I had my Nintendo 64 because I would love to play that on original hardware. Okay. Next question is from Amy Makes That. My good friend Amy, who is about to hit I think 100,000 on, on YouTube. Yeah. Just about to hit 100,000 on YouTube. Unbelievable. My friends are doing really well. <laughs> um, what's next for Handmade by Vincent Ferrari? And wedding updates. Do you have a date, venue, etc.? Okay, so what's next for Handmade by Vincent Ferrari? Handmade by Vincent Ferrari is going to be what it's going to be. 
Um, and that's not really an answer. But here's the thing with Handmade by Vincent Ferrari. Handmade by Vincent Ferrari is always going to be my outlet for making stuff, art, cutting boards, whatever the hell I make, that's my outlet for it, Handmade by Vincent Ferrari. Um, what I'm hoping to do is transition it into more of a digital asset business, in which case I have to get my digital skills up. I readily admit that. Um, but in order to keep the business going, it's going to have to pivot. It's not going to be able to be, it's going to be smaller goods that I can make in my apartment, or it's going to be digital goods, which I can make pretty much anywhere. Um, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to maintain the cutting board business. Once I get the Glowforge working, the laser stuff will come back, which will be good because that was a big, big part of my business. And I'm very excited about getting the Glowforge running again. Um, but that's going to take time. I mean, it's just all going to take time. It's an unexpected pivot that I'm making. It's, I'm turning the Titanic, essentially, because my business was all one thing, and now I'm trying to make it into something else. And that means figuring out new ways to pitch myself, new ways to sell stuff. I'm not sure it's going to work, but I am sure that I'm going to give it one hell of a try. Um, yeah. That's what's next for Handmade by Vincent Ferrari. As far as wedding updates, um, like I was saying before, nothing specific yet because we only know roughly a time frame that we want it to happen. Neither of us want to be engaged forever. We don't have a venue, which is interesting because she has family in Philly and I have, you know, she has family also in the tip of Long Island. So it's going to be interesting trying to find a venue. But I think our, our philosophy is let's just have a venue that pisses everyone off. Because no matter where we pick, it's going to piss somebody off. So let's just make sure we're pissing everyone off. And whoever comes, comes. And, you know, respect the fact that not everybody wants to make the trip for someone's second wedding. I have a feeling a lot of people are going to make the trip, though. It tends to surprise you when you're getting married for the second time and you think no one wants to show up and you send out invitations and you get 100% yeses. I've heard this from people who had their second marriage uh, and they were surprised by the percentage of people that were like, sure, I'll come to that. Um, but I don't know. We shall see. Last question, and I love that this question, this is such, this is such a good question, and it's such a good question partially because of who it comes from. And the, the question is from Ethan Carter, and he asks, what was your favorite episode from each era of the show? And I know what he means by era, and I love that he called it eras, because that's how I refer to them too. So I love that he called it eras. So I break the show down into four eras. There was the solo era when it first started from episode one through 12. Wow, this is bad because I, no offense, Ethan, I forgot what episode was your first. I think 12 was your first episode, if I remember correctly. I think 1 through 11 was me solo. So that first era, my favorite episode, oof. Okay, I have two answers for this one, and there's a reason for it. My favorite episode is Ev was Evan and Caitlin because I, I think they were at episode 7 or 8. Like, it was really early on. And there was no reason in hell that they should have had any interest in being on my crappy little brand new podcast with no listeners. But they were. And it was a huge boost to me to get them, even at that point, where they weren't anywhere near as big as they are now. But Evan and Caitlin coming on my podcast that quickly, because they don't do a lot of guests, even now. Like, you don't hear them as guests on podcasts very often. They do a lot of their own stuff now. They've pivoted multiple times how they present themselves. Um, the funny thing is Kathy is probably the biggest Evan and Caitlin fan ever. Ka Kathy absolutely adores Evan and Caitlin. So, not that she shouldn't. It's just Kathy's not a maker. That's kind of the point. And she is all about Evan and Caitlin. Loves them, so... It worked, guys. You got people loving you for your personality and whatever. But anyway, then there's the Ethan Carter era. And this becomes a little tricky because we had... 
so many guests. I mean, I, Ethan was my longest running co-host. And if I had to pick, and boy, I'm going to hurt some feelings, and I don't mean to, and I'm very sorry if I hurt anyone's feelings. But I have to say that the, 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 the guest who... The guest who I was the most nervous about, the guest who had the biggest impact on me, the guest that I was so terrified that I was going to screw up with was Dan Roto from the Danocracy because I've said it before. I've said it a million times. Dan is... I mean, I always... Bob is... Bob is my, you know, maker father, so to speak. Like, Bob is the reason I am a maker. Bob from I Like to Make Stuff. But Dan, if I had to talk about people that inspire me, Dan Roto is one of the most inspirational human beings that I have ever come across. He just inspires the absolute hell out of me to, you know, if I'm doing something artistic, it's probably due to him. Um, if I'm taking an artistic risk, it's probably due to him. If I'm playing with a new medium, it's probably because of him. And granted, our work doesn't overlap. My stuff doesn't look like his stuff. But Dan is just a fountain of inspiration if you watch his videos. And I absolutely love that dude. And talking to him was just... I remember thinking when he said yes, he would come on. I remember thinking like, oh my God, what now? And I've never, I don't usually have those thoughts. I mean, you guys hear me on the show. I'm not the kind to get starstruck by my guests. I'm impressed sometimes that somebody is willing to talk. Sure, of course. I mean, I've had some pretty impressive guests over the years. But man, talking to Dan Roto, it's like, wow. That, he's the dude. I mean, he's, he's the dude. And he's talking to me, so... Yeah, the Ethan Carter era, definitely Dan Roto. And the funny thing is, Ethan and Dan have worked together since he was on the show, and that's how they met. So you know what? It's clearly had a big impact on Ethan's life also. But yeah, Dan Roto was the big one. Oh, and I just realized I never said the second episode from the Ethan Carter episode. The second episode was the Bob Claggett episode. And I loved it because I got to speak to, I don't want to call him a hero because that's, kind of weird. You know, we're adults here. But he is kind of a hero of mine. Um, and even though that episode was an absolute disaster because I was I had chemo brain when I did it. Um, and I would love, by the way, Bob, I know you occasionally listen to this show. I know Jimmy listens to the show. Um, if I could have you for one more episode to redo that one. <laughs> I might actually try to get in touch with Bob. I would love a chance to redo that interview. Just to not have the fog of chemo sitting over my head and to just have a chat with him. Because people have told me it's not as bad as I make it out to be. To me, it was awful. It's the worst interview I've ever done. And I was happy to do it. it was, but it was really not to the level that I want an interview to be. With um, especially with somebody of that magnitude in my life. So I may see if I can get Bob on again. I don't know if he'll do it. He's a busy boy now. But um, okay, so we got that. We have the Ethan Carter era. What's next? The Brooke Deneau era. Who in the Brooke Deneau era? I think... The guy who invented the bop it, and I really feel like a jerk because I never remember his name. I know his first name was Dan, but I can never remember his last name. Um, the guy who invented the bop it, because that was just such a huge pivot in what this show, well, what Because We Make was, where we was just, it was just makers. It was just all makers, maker, 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 maker. But having, having the inventor of an iconic toy from my youth and a lot of people's childhood that was awesome. Like to, 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 to have him on and just pick his brain and realize what a cool guy he was. Like it was, it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. I had no right to think, I had no right to think that anyone like that would be interested in coming on my tiny little podcast. And yet here he was the inventor of the bop it on screen with Brooke and I, and it was, it was pretty fantastic. Um, 
and it made me confident and comfortable knowing that I can have guests at any magnitude and at least be able to put on a competent interview with them. So, because I don't really do interviews, which is probably part of it. But yeah, that was a big one for me. It was mentally, even like looking back at it, when people say, what do I do? I was like, oh, I want people ask me now what I do. What's my podcast about? I tell them and them. And they say, oh, what kind of guests do you guys? I was like, you know, you, you, did you have a bop? It is, yeah, of course I had a bop. Yeah, well, we had the inventor of the bop it on. Did you watch the show? Um, is it cake? You know, well, we had one of the contestants from Is It Cake on. You know, we've had all the cast of the of the Netflix show Making Fun. Like, we've had some, over the years, some banger-level guests on this show. And But, yeah, the, definitely the episode with the inventor of the bop it, that was... That was A tier or S tier as the kids do now with those tier lists on YouTube, which I love those videos. But anyway, and the last era would be the digitally creative era. And this is an interesting one because I can't think of the immediate answer pops into my head. And I'm like, okay, what if it's who would it be if not that? Ep what episode would it be if not that one? And I can't think of one. And of course, the episode is the very first episode of Digitally Creative, which was the second episode that was recorded, but the first one that went out into the feed. And it was, of course, the godfather, Jimmy DeResta. Because this podcast exists. I, had the, I was comfortable doing it because I knew that I had the support of people like Jimmy behind me. Um, Jimmy getting behind this podcast and saying, you know, hey, if you ever bring Because We Make Back, I want to be your first guest. No, I didn't say I want to be. He said I will be your first guest. And when I decided I was bringing back a podcast, I didn't even have a name for it, but I said I was bringing back a podcast. And um, I said to Jimmy, I was like, well, I distinctly remember a certain person telling me that, you know, if I brought it back, he'd be my first guest. Well, I'm bringing it back. And he goes, when are we recording? Like he remembered, you know, and it was, it was, it meant a lot to me, you know, to, you know, it's, it's weird because, you know, when someone like Jimmy, when you're on his radar, it's, it's surreal because so many of us, I mean, let's be honest, if you're a maker, you've watched Jimmy's stuff. I, I don't know a single maker that doesn't know who the guy is, right? I mean, he's, there's a reason he's called the Godfather and it ain't because he named himself that which I think is hysterical. Like when somebody calls him the Godfather and people are like, oh, look how arrogant this guy is. He calls himself the Godfather. He doesn't call himself the Godfather. He hates it. We all call him the Godfather. But Jimmy is like, to be on his radar and to matter in his world, and a lot of people do. He's very good at this. He knows, he's one of those crazy people that just knows everyone in the community and knows everything that's going on. He knows what you're working on. He knows what you're told. If you're doing a podcast and he listens, he knows who you've spoken to. He could talk to you about your ep He's very engaged, and that's why he's the godfather. And the fact that I register anywhere in that brain that's just loaded with people and things, and it's amazing to me. You know, every time I see the man, it's like, it's like seeing an old friend. Hugs and smiles and... In fact, um, I'm really one of the things I'm looking forward to most at Maker Camp is getting to see Jimmy for a few minutes. Even though I know he's, I'm gonna have to fight off a crowd with sh with a baseball bat to get three seconds with him at Maker Camp. But anyway, yeah, that was definitely the um, digitally creative era. The definite the definite answer to that question is the Jimmy episode because, you know, it was a big freaking deal. And you know. I've had some great episodes of Digitally Creative that I'm quite proud of. I mean, the show in October is going to be one year old. I mean, I always say it's older than that because it is really the continuation of Because We Make, but Digitally Creative will be a year old in October, and I've had some crazy guests on here that I've had to do a one-on-one -on -one with, which has been quite an eye-opener for me, you know, to not have the fallback position of, oh, I'm having an off night. My host can pick up, my co-host can pick up the slack. There's no one to pick up the slack. If I have a garbage night, it's a garbage night, and that's a garbage episode. Sorry. Um, I like to think I don't have a lot of those. I know that not everyone is a absolute barn burner, but I think I do a pretty good job. I don't know. Maybe. I, I guess based on the list of people that support the show financially, I'm doing something right. Otherwise, they wouldn't be putting their money behind this. So, yeah, the, the, the other episode from the digitally creative era, and it's a recent one, obviously, is the Bobby Duke episode, because, I mean, when I finished that episode, I was emotional. 
because it was just like he was so open and so honest and just so blunt. And, you know, I didn't we didn't hear from the character of Bobby Duke. We heard from Bobby Duke, the real the guy, Bobby Duke, the human being. And to get that raw insight into a person's personality like that. And, you know, when he talked about addiction and, you know, his depression and his various struggles and how art basically dragged him out of them. It's powerful stuff. And one of the, <laughs> one of the things you don't know is you get somebody, you're like, am I going to get, you know, am I going to get a guy who's going to sit there mute or give me one word answers? Or am I going to get a guy who's engaged, who wants to talk and open up and is just looking for a prompt to get them going? And I've had both in this podcast. I have, you know, there's a guest and I will not say what era and I won't say who it was, but, you know, yes answers, yes, no answers, which are death and never really opened up for the entire episode. And this was a person who is a huge following on YouTube and we, you know, my co-host and I, and I, like I said, I'm not going to tell you which one, but my co-host and I thought it was going to be a barn burner. We thought we killed it. It was like, oh, look, I can't believe we got this person. It's going to be amazing. Let's do it. It was a complete flop. But the good thing is it was such an obvious flop, and the reason was so obvious that when it did flop, when it did flop, people actually messaged both of us and were like, what the hell is his problem? So I was like, awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, Ethan, that was a great question, man. And, of course, you know, it's the kind of question that someone who is a former co-host of a show can ask because that's the kind of question that would get me talking, and it did get me talking, and I truly appreciate it. Um, the other thing that, of course, gets me talking is the people that support this show financially. You like that, right? And... Since I have a little extra time since it's just me, I'm just going to say that I really do appreciate all of you. Um, I've talked a lot in the last couple of weeks about the money thing, the job thing, and how it doesn't seem to be panning out and how I'm struggling. And it really does mean a lot to me that you guys are there helping me pick up some of the slack. And it's a big, big deal. Trust me, it's a big deal. And you could support any number of podcasts, any number of ways, but you choose to put your money behind this one, and I am very, very grateful that you do so. And the people I'm grateful to include the following. Best Man Al Schultz from New York Woodworks, Scott Orham from Daddy Yourself DIY, Ed Swanson of Ed Clo Ed's Clocks and More, Nick Birchtold of Birchtold Design Build, Tori Decker of Tori Did It, Jake Drews of Make With Jake, Megan Chris from Onyx Designs Woodwork, Christian Neary of Warren Works, Ken Madden from Mad K Studios, David Wood of DW Wood Builds, Dean Duplantis, Chris Raley of Route 9 Signs, Jeff Stein, a.k.a. A Weird Guy, Kim and Garrett from Kim and Garrett Make It, Rory Langefeld of RLO Woodworks and DIY, Robert J. Keller, Brian Arsenault, The Seven Hills Maker, Dave Bauer, Dave Bauer Art, Donald LeBlanc of Fun With Woodworking, Ross Cave, Jeremy Spies, Grant Alexander of The Clamp Podcast, Brad Harrison of Brad's Customs, and Billy Poulton of Poulton Projects. You guys, thank you so much for supporting the show. It means the world to me. I know I say it every week, and believe me, I mean it every week. I could not do this without you. There's a lot of things I could not do right now without your support, and every little bit of it means the absolute world to me, and I am eternally grateful for all the help that you're giving me right now. If you can't support the show financially, I completely understand. Believe me, I understand probably more than anyone. Um, but if you can't support the show financially, a new review would be very helpful. We haven't had a review on the show in a very long time, so a new review would be super helpful. If you haven't reviewed the show in a minute, jump over and review it. Um, I get notifications for reviews that appear on, I want to say Pocket Casts and Apple. If you review it anywhere else, just shoot me a heads up so I can, so I'll see it, and I'll make sure that it's read on the show. Even if it's this guy is terrible, I hate listening to him, um, because you know what, Jutalen is infinitely famous on this show for giving me the only bad review I ever got on this show. Anyway, 
thank you so much for all you do to support the show and support me. I really, really deeply appreciate it. My thing of the week this week, and Jeff had a good idea, but you know what? I'm not going to lie. I haven't been engaged enough in the community, or at least as much as I would like to say I could do a couple of these, like projects I've seen that cross my eye. Um, but I will say this. My thing of the week this week is, <laughs> it's not going to be a huge surprise, but it's going to be Dan Roto, um, the Danocracy. And why is Dan my thing of the week? Because he's been doing for a couple, actually for a couple of years now. Yeah, it's been a couple of years because I was watching it in my old house. He, would, he did a series on his YouTube channel called Shot and Forgot. And it was great. Um, he would get old film and he would figure out where the picture was taken and whatever. Well, he just recently did a four-part series on this box of film that he got, a box of slide film that he got in an estate sale. And he tracked down and he figured out the whole family story for the people in the pictures. And the last episode, <laughs> I'm already getting emotional, but the last episode is like a super tearjerker. It's a super tearjerker. So I would highly recommend um, checking it out. It's not a tearjerker in sad. It's a tearjerker as in it's emotional. And if you have a heart, you're going to get choked up. Like, I don't know. Dan, I know you're reasonably well at this point. I don't know how you did that without, I don't know how you got through that without getting emotional. I don't know how many takes it took, but good on you, dude, because, man, I was having trouble keeping it together just watching it. So it's, I'm even having trouble talking about it. <laughs> But it's a great, it's great. The last four episodes of Shot and Forgot that he did on his Instagram reels is A-level content. Or as again, as, I, as the kids do now with their tier list, S-tier content. Absolutely fantastic. And I think if you want to be inspired or just entertained, you know, Dan is just a great guy to, uh, Dan's a great guy to be following. He has a podcast. He has a YouTube channel. He has TikTok and Instagram Reels. And the dude puts out an insane amount of content. So check him out. You won't be disappointed, I don't think. What I do think, though, is that's going to do it for this week's episode. Um, I don't know what the story is for next week. Um, it's a little rough with the holidays, so I might end up, having, I might end up taking the week off because no one's going to be available this weekend. It's already Tuesday. Um, probably just film something next week to go the week after. So I'm probably going to take the week off. You should take the week off too. spend some time with your family. It's a holiday. Um, if you're not in the United States, it's Labor Day, which means we celebrate working hard by not working at all. I say that with a sarcastic smile on my face. I actually appreciate the fact that we're giving people some mandatory time off and mandatory time off is not a bad thing. So um, if you're in the United States, enjoy your Labor Day weekend. I hope it's amazing for you. Oh, wait. No, yeah, enjoy your Labor Day weekend because this is going to be released tomorrow. I had to think about that for a second. Um, enjoy it. Celebrate. Spend time with your family. Eat some hamburgers and hot dogs. And um, I will see you all again next week. Until then, have a great week, everybody. And I will talk to you. Mm -hmm.